Hey everybody, and welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today, we'll be watching Early Muslim Expansion, Part 2 of 4, by Kings and Generals. Welcome back to the second part of this two-hour-long video. So, where we left off last time, basically, uh, we saw, you know, the emergence of very early Islam. Uh, we saw the general, Khalid ibn al-Walid, basically uh, whooping. Uh, the Sassanids, uh, to put it in scholarly terms, uh, he basically had a couple of pretty impressive victories, um, and we ended right as the Shah was sending two more armies to go and confront Khalid and try and defeat the Arab invaders. Um, so that's where we're starting off from in this reaction. Um, if you guys end up enjoying this reaction, I'd appreciate it if you would check out my Patreon, which is linked down below and has exclusive content. And without any further ado, let's jump right into this reaction. He decided that his smaller force needed to defeat one of the armies opposing him, and he could not allow them to reinforce each other. And, I mean, I think he's exactly right. <laughs> I know I'm doing an instant pause, but we are jumping right back into it. Khalid is exactly right that he should defeat one of these forces, because if they manage to combine, uh, then he will be in a lot of trouble. But, you know, he's faster than them, more maneuverable, more mobile. This gives him the opportunity to take, to take out the Sassanid forces separately uh, and hopefully you know, win him some victories, some more victories. So he left a minor garrison around Ubala and marched west, hoping to defeat Andesigar without alerting Bahman. Mm. Along the way, Khalid reinforced his army from the Arab tribes, which were now more eager to join his ranks, since the tax imposed by him was lower than the one they had to pay before, and that brought his numbers to around 15 to 20,000. The goal okay. was to destroy the army under Andazagar before Bahman could reinforce it. I mean, we're still dealing with a lot of people. Khalid has a pretty uh, impressive, sizable force, but if he has to fight these two enemy armies at once, he may be in trouble. Although, you know, maybe he'd be able to defeat them combined, but it would be a much harder victory to win and may end up being a loss. Um... It's a lot more even if he can face them one on one. Although Bahman's army noticed the movement of the Arabs, they were much slower, so Khalid was able to reach Andazagar well before Bahman, sometime in the second half of May. Mm. According to the sources, Andazagar had enough room to maneuver and wait for Bahman along the river, but he was confident in his troops and kept his position. For almost a day, the two armies seemingly remained in their respective camps, within reach of each other, without attempting to start a battle. Mm. The Arabs were probably resting after their forced march, and the Sassanids were hoping that this wait meant they might be reinforced. However, this wait couldn't last, since Khalid knew that he had to score a decisive victory before the second Sassanid army arrived. Yeah, I mean, you know, Khalid has been victorious so far, you know, he's got momentum, um, he's probably got a lot higher morale among his men than the Sassanids do, but he is under pressure in this situation, you know, he cannot afford to wait, um, because then the Persians will be able to reinforce, so he has to attack pretty much as quickly as possible, which, you know, puts a lot of pressure on him and his men. So on the next day, both forces formed up in standard formation with a center and two wings. The battlefield near Walaja was an even plain stretching between two low, flat ridges, which were about one kilometer away from each other. To the northeast was a barren desert, with the river Kasif running close to the eastern ridge. Both armies had the ridges behind them, meaning mm. that an attack from the rear was not possible to begin with. The Sassanid leader was surprised to see the whole Muslim army was smaller than previously reported, and that it only consisted of footmen, which contradicted what he had heard about the crucial role Khalid's cavalry played in the previous battles. Despite that, he was convinced that his position was impenetrable and mm. decided to wait, as both armies knew that Bahman couldn't be too far away. Yeah. Indeed, the Muslim commander ordered his entire army forward. Led by Khalid, who fought in the front rank, 
the army of the Caliphate charged into the enemy. For an hour or so, the two lines fought to a standstill, losing few warriors. I mean, I would say, I think the cavalry has been, been one of the main strengths of the Arab forces up until this point. And so an infantry on infantry battle, um, that would be a lot more even, or I would say, you know, even in favor of the Persians, because they've got, you know, I think better armored infantry. Um, that's sort of the main uh, force of their armies, usually, uh, as compared to uh, Arab forces or these Muslim forces, which have been, you know, really the cavalry has played a big role. Um, so, you know, I think this is kind of a much riskier position for Khalid to be in, um, you know, without a substantial cavalry force at the moment. But the Sassanids had the numbers, so their tired front line was mm. replaced by the rear rank, which gave them the edge. Despite Khalid's personal martial skill, his troops were getting tired, so Andazigar's counterattack started to push the Muslim troops back. Slowly but surely, the Sassanids advanced, while the Arabs were getting dangerously close to the ridge, which would have made any retreat impossible. At this point, Khalid gave a signal that changed the course of the battle. The cavalry that he sent into the desert during the previous night appeared on the eastern ridge behind the Sassanid army. There we go. That's pretty convenient. <laughs> this was Khalid's trademark move as his mobile cavalry was able to hide in the deserts with ease. The advance of the Sassanid army away from its fortified position meant mm. that its rear was undefended. The light Arab horsemen charged into the Sassanid lines. I mean, convenient, but also, as they said, exactly in line with Arab strategy. While Khalid's infantry lengthened their front to envelop the wings of Andazagar's army, Minutes later, the Battle of Walaja was over. The Sassanid commander was dead, and his army was completely destroyed, with only 5,000 survivors managing to retreat from the field. Jeez, another loss, another L for the Sassanids. Um, you know, and it's pretty remarkable because, um, like we mentioned last time, this is similar to other Arab raids or nomadic raids that um, the Sassanids have faced before, but on a much larger scale, these Muslim raids, they have been far more successful than a lot of other nomadic raids. Um, you know, they've basically just emerged in a historical context, and they're already handing the Persians several notable L's. So it's pretty remarkable how sort of quickly, um, you know, uh, the uh, Muslim raiders advanced um, and, you know, won all these victories. Khalid's casualties were around 3,000. As Khalid's troops were tired after the long march and the battle, his army wasn't able to pursue the Sassanid survivors. Those were mostly the Christian Arabs who were more mobile, and they managed to find shelter in nearby Elis. Mm. The messengers from this group went to other Christian Arab tribes to the northwest asking for help, and also informed the Shah in Tesiphon. The tribes answered the call of their kin, while Yazdegerd sent messengers to Barman to go towards Elis. It is not clear why, as Arab and Persian sources are conflicted, but according to the former, Barman gave command over his army to another general called Jaban, who marched with the entire army to where the Christian Arabs were concentrating. The Persian mm. sources claim that Barman returned to Tesiphon with his entire army. Interesting. Yeah, so this is an example of where we run into sort of an issue with our sources. And I mentioned this last time that, you know, whenever we're looking at history, regardless of the topic or the era, we always have to consider what sources we're drawing from because all sources are biased, right? And so we have to analyze sources, analyze that bias, work out, you know, how exactly that alters the information we're getting and try to drag out as much objective information as we can. Um, not that objectivity is ever really achievable, but we try to get as close as possible. Um, and in this case, you know, we have conflicting sources, and so it's really hard to sort of decide, um, you know, what happened or what to present. Um, and not to mention that I know in this era in particular, 
um, the sources are really sparse. And the sources we do have are mostly um, Arab Muslim sources. And of course, they have an interest in presenting um, themselves favorably. So we have to take everything with a grain of salt. You know, I've seen your guys' comments about, um, you know, these lack of sources and how they can be unreliable. Um, and, and some of you have an issue with how kings and generals uh, are presenting this. But what I will say is, you know, I, I think they've done a fairly good job of letting us know that, you know, letting us know what sources they're drawing from, when the sources conflict, when the sources may be inaccurate. Um, and, you know, at the very least, be assured I'm keeping that in mind, you know. I mean, I've studied history. I understand this. I don't just take everything at face value. Um, you know, I understand that we have to keep in mind what sources we're drawing from and that the sources here can be pretty unreliable. Um, so, you know, everything presented should be taken with a grain of salt and some things in particular should be analyzed a little more closely. But like I said, I mean, they mentioned here that the Persian and Arab sources conflict and they've mentioned that kind of stuff before. Um, but it's just something to keep in mind when we're studying history or uh, making or watching historical content like this. Meanwhile, Khalid moved his troops towards the city and sometime in May, fought the allied Christian Arab and Sassanid army near Elis. Mm. The details of the battle are lost, but we know that the Muslims won. The sources are once again conflicted on the number of casualties, with the Arab sources stating that Khalid's force killed 70,000 enemies, mostly through the executions after the battle, while the Persian writers think that the army facing Khalid's 18,000 was comparable in size and managed to retreat towards al Hira after a minor defeat. Mm. Yeah, and so we have two very different um, sources on what happened. And so we have to look at those and look at the other evidence we have. Um, I imagine in this case, mostly archaeological evidence, and try to parse out any semblance of the truth. Now I can tell you that um, I'm almost certain that the Arabs did not execute or kill 70,000 enemies. That would be pretty ridiculous. Um, so the numbers are probably far less. But then again, we don't know exactly what happened. So this stuff's really tricky. In any case, in the last days of May, Khalid approached al Hira, which was the initial goal of his campaign. Mm. Again, the sources are inconclusive. We know that the local Sassanid garrison and their Arab allies mounted resistance for a few days, but eventually the sides decided to negotiate. And I will say, I do think it's a credit to kings and generals that they still try to present this history, even with the lack and the difficulty with sources. You know, um, my expertise is more in modern European history. And while, you know, I still have to consider all these things that we've talked about regarding sources and bias, at the very least, I usually have a multitude of sources to draw from. But when looking at ancient history, this topic in particular, <laughs> uh, this is really tricky, and sources are a big problem. So I think credit to them that they're at least trying to do the topic justice, even with the lackluster information that we have on the topic. As Khalid promised to spare the lives of the population in exchange for the payment of the Jizya tax, the locals decided to surrender. The Arab commander spent the next few months building up a new administration in the region and collecting taxes. Mm. At the same time, raiding parties were sent to central Iraq and towards the border of the Eastern Roman Empire, and this raiding brought both loot and information on enemy movement. Some sources claim that the Caliphate gained a degree of control over central Iraq, but it seems that Khalid didn't have enough troops to keep such a wide region under his authority. Mm. Still, the Caliphate's raiding parties were not getting much resistance to the north and northeast, while his scouts informed him that the Sassanid garrisons to the northwest were still intact, with larger concentrations at Ambar and Ain al Tamur. The first one was further away, and the direct route to it was through Ain al Tamur, but attacking the fort of Anbar would have been more unexpected. So, in late June of 633, Khalid left half of his troops in Al Hira and marched west towards Anbar with a 10,000 strong army. 
Anbar would become the first Arab attack across the Euphrates River. The details of the engagement that happened here are unclear, but it seems that Khalid's decision to attack Anbar surprised his opponents, and the leader of the garrison, Shirzad, was forced to surrender after... Wow. I mean, it is worth noting that, you know, at this point, the Arabs are getting, you know, not super far, but definitely into the meat of Persian territory and into important Persian territory. Whereas prior to this, they mostly stuck to the edges of the desert. Not to mention that um, these Muslims are setting up their own administration. So as we mentioned earlier, they're doing things a little differently from typical nomadic raiders, um, which the Persians or the Sassanid Empire has faced many times before. This is a little different in character. And of course, it will go on to be very different in character down the line. After the Arab archers showed their effectiveness, then the Caliphate's raiding parties approached the town of Ain al-Tamur from the direction of al hira so when Khalid engaged the Sassanid troops, mostly made up of Christian Arabs from the west, in July, mm. he was able to win with relative ease. The leader of the Christian Arabs was taken prisoner and then executed, and the city surrendered to the Muslims. Events of the next few months between July and September are shrouded in mystery as some mm. sources claim that Khalid was staying in Ambar and Ain al Tamur, slowly setting up the administration of the newly acquired region, which seems uncharacteristically passive for him. Others claim that the last two remnants of the apostate activity of the Ridda Wars were to the south, so Khalid moved most of his non-garrisoned troops towards Dormat al Jandal and helped his fellow Caliphate general, Ayad bin Ghanim, defeat the rebels in the region. Hmm. This inactivity or absence gave some time to the Sassanids, and they started recruiting and concentrating five armies in the area between Mazaya and Husayd. Kekka bin Amr, who was left to command the garrison at al hira ordered the raiding parties in central Iraq and the garrisons of Anbar and Ain al-Tamur to take positions to the south of the Sassanid forces, delay them as much as possible, and not allow these four small armies to unite into one force. At the end of September, Khalid returned to al hira alongside the troops he picked up around Dormat al-Jandal and ordered Kaka bin Amr and Abu Layla to lead portions of the garrison to Husayd and Kenafis respectively and take command while his troops rested in the city. Apparently, small Muslim and Sassanid armies fought minor battles in October and the Sassanids suffered minor defeats which compelled them to retreat towards Muzia. Hmm. Khalid now had an open route to the Sassanid capital, Tessif. Yeah, he certainly does. I mean, just looking at this on a map, uh, they had a... The Muslims had a garrison in Anbar, and we can see that um, they are very close to the Shah himself, to the capital, Tessifon. Um, even though they're not too, like, deep into Sassanid territory, they're at a very important point in Sassanid territory. Um you know, raiding along the edges of the desert. Now they're moving in a little bit. So, you know, I'm sure the Shah is getting uh, pretty nervous with how close they're drawing to him. But the Sassanid army at Muzia and the concentrations of the Christian Arabs in the area between Sani and Zemil were still a threat. So the Caliphate commander decided against attacking Tessifon. The main Sassanid army at Muzia probably considered its position to be safe, since it would be difficult to attack them without going through Sani'i and Zemil. Mm. At the same time, Khalid knew that attacking the majority light cavalry Arab Christians could push them to the north to unite with the troops at Muzia, so Khalid devised a plan. His army was already divided into three corps, and they moved directly against the Persians using the desert to avoid Sani'i and Zemil. I, you know, I was thinking about that when they said it may be difficult to reach the Arab Christians without going through these other cities. Of course, we have to remember who they're fighting. Um, you know, Arab Muslims who really thrive with warfare uh, in the desert or on the edge of the desert. That's how they've been fighting so far. So, you know, I wouldn't put it past them that instead of going through all these different cities and allowing their enemies to unite, that they managed to make a dash through the desert 
uh, and catch their enemies unaware. And that appears to be exactly what they're doing. This was technically very difficult, as all three corps had to not only bypass the enemy armies without being detected, but also arrive at the decided location simultaneously. It was risky, but the possible reward was also high. Mm. Everything worked as planned. Khalid's corps converged on the target at the same time, and during one of the nights in the first week of November, his 20,000 attacked the sleeping Sassanid army of comparable size. Yeah, I mean, we're dealing with some pretty classic hit-and-run strategies that we often see from uh, nomadic peoples or horse-riding peoples um, that are particularly effective when used against the forces of a larger, more sedentary empire. Um, this is a familiar trend from this era, um, and we're seeing it play out here. The latter was not expecting this attack, and... Th Though, perhaps on a much bigger scale than usual. The army of the Caliphate scored an easy victory, killing more than 10,000 Sassanid warriors. After that, defeating a smaller Christian Arab force seemed easy, but instead of confronting them head-on, Khalid repeated his three-pronged maneuver to avoid losses. The Muslims suffered minimal losses, while the Christian Arabs lost more than half of their army. Mm. Apparently, a few recent Muslim converts were among the killed, and their families sent an appeal to the Caliph Abu Bakr to punish Khalid. This rejected appeal was sent through the future Caliph Umar, and will become important for our story down the line. Interesting. Khalid's mobility and the inability of his opponents to consolidate their forces meant that the region between Muzayyah and al hira was now under the control of the Caliphate. I do wonder to what extent, like what relationship these Arab Christians had with, let's say, the rest of the Sassanid Empire, given that, you know, at least the traditional religion of the Persians was Zoroastrianism, um, and of course these are uh, Christians. Uh, not to mention that, you know, Islam has not been around for that long at this point, you know, these Muslims, they're also people of the book, you know, um, one of, uh, you know, you know, Judaism, Christianity, Islam. They're not too far off in many ways from these Christian Arabs, but, you know, especially considering that they haven't been around for that long. So I think this sort of like religious interplay is interesting. And I wonder what sort of relationships were at play between, you know, the Muslim Arabs, the Christian Arabs, the Christian Arabs and the Zoroastrian Persians. Um, you know, I really don't know much. This is not my area of expertise, but it is uh, fascinating. We have sparse information on the early administration of these lands. The Muslim sources claim that while the Persians living in the cities were often taken captive and enslaved, the local Arab population was forced to pay the jizya tax, but was otherwise allowed a degree of autonomy and even freedom of worship. Yeah, and so that's something that we get this from Arab sources. You know, we don't really know if that was true or not. Uh, I'm sure some historians have done great work on trying to parse through this and work out what early uh, Arab Muslim administration was really like. But from my perspective, I just have to say, you know, uh, I, I hear what those sources say, and uh, I really have no way to judge the accuracy. More raids were sent across the Euphrates in the next month, while Khalid was contemplating what his next move should be. Attacking Tesiphon was still dangerous, as that would have stretched the supply lines too much. Yeah. But that made an attack on the only Sassanid target in the area, the city of Firaz, the only option. Firaz was right on the border of the Sassanid and Eastern Roman empires. Mm. Khalid and his 20,000 reached the area in December. Getting pretty close to the Eastern Roman Empire now. Uh, I will be very excited for when we get to the Eastern Romans, because, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a, a lot more familiar with the Eastern Roman Empire than uh, the Sassanid Empire. Um, and also, you know, this is all, you know, we've got a very interesting clash coming up between the Romans and the Arabs. Uh, the Orthodox Byzantine Empire uh, and the Muslim Caliphate. So, this is some, some exciting stuff. Once again, the sources are conflicted. 
but a few details that have reached our times allow us to form a coherent timeline. We know that the local Sassanid and Roman garrisons united their strength on the north side of the Euphrates, while Khalid held the crossing on the other side. Despite hmm. the fact that the Muslim sources state that the united Roman Sassanid force was large, it is fair to assume that neither empire could have a large force in the area, since the Sassanids needed those troops in central Iraq, while the Romans were concentrating their own forces on the crucial coastal areas and urban centers already being raided by the smaller Muslim armies. Yeah, it's doubtful that the Sassanids or the Romans would have gathered a large force together here in particular. Even with a united force and the inclusion of the local Arab tribes, the Allies, led by the Sassanid commander, Hormoz Jadiyi, probably had between 15 and 25,000 troops. For five or six weeks, the armies remained opposite each other, as neither side had a safe place to cross the river. Wow. It seems that sometime in the third week of January, Khalid slightly retreated from the positions he held, perhaps baiting his counterpart into attacking. Indeed, the Allied force crossed the river and formed up against the Muslims. Both sides had a similar disposition, with infantry in the center and cavalry on the wings. Mm. The Allied army charged the Muslims, probably hopeful that their heavier equipment would give them an advantage. Slowly but surely, this charge pushed Khalid's lines back. Simultaneously, the Muslim general ordered the cavalry units from the second rank to leave the main body and take position to the far left. The Roman Sassanid army continued to advance, and the Muslims retreated even further. Hmm. Khalid's detached force was ordered to take the bridge and then attack the Allies from the rear. This maneuver was successful, and Hormuz Jadiyi's army immediately started losing cohesion. Yeah, you know, it's a pretty simple uh, flanking maneuver. You know, you have your horsemen ride around while you continuously back up. Um, but, you know, it's effective. Uh, it's a typical maneuver, it's a simple one. But uh, if it works, it works. The Allies thought that there was another big Muslim army that took the bridge and would soon surround them. Simultaneously, Khalid's main force started their counterattack, and those units of the Allied army not killed on the spot started routing towards the northeast. A certain number managed to swim across the river, but more than half of the Allied army was killed. Mm. Khalid lost a few hundred from his ranks. Jeez. Khalid was about to attack deeper into Persian territory, but he soon after received a letter from the Caliph Abu Bakr at the Rashidun capital of Medina. The letter ordered him to cease his attacks on the Sassanids and to move into Syria to battle the Romans. Ooh. So Khalid and a small contingent of his army prepared to move west. As with the Mesopotamian invasions, there had probably been no better opportunity for a strike into Roman lands, as the destructive quarter-century-long conflict from 602 to 628 had undermined crucial defences in both regions. Mm. The Roman East, with all its religious, cultural, financial and strategic significance, was now dangerously vulnerable. Yep. During 633, the Muslims sent four separate corps to invade Palestine, in addition to the areas around the Sea of Galilee, the River Jordan, and the Dead Sea. And I mean, to be fair, you have to keep in mind that, and this is, I guess, a general point, you know, the Eastern Roman Empire was a gigantic fucking empire. Um, I mean, it would shrink and expand over time, but we're talking about a lot of territory, that is a lot of territory to defend, and they would constantly struggle to defend their territory. Um, you know, particularly the borderlands were often left pretty undefended. And so, as a more general rule, the Romans would often suffer pretty um, devastating raids from enemies along their borders because they just really couldn't manage to defend them. You know, we are long past the days of the strong imperial Roman Empire based in Rome. Uh, you know, this is a new era of Roman, of Eastern Roman, of Byzantine history. Um, and so it's not too surprising that the Arabs would manage to, uh, to make a stab 
uh, at Roman territory. And, I mean, we'll see how this whole thing goes, but the Romans are going to struggle. Though they achieved success, assaults on the large urban settlements of the region could not be considered until reinforcements were brought up. So, both for the additional troops and for Khalid's expertise in warfare, Abu Bakr sent the order for him to move west. Mm. To save time and to bypass Roman defences, the Muslim general chose a more dangerous route through an especially desolate, waterless stretch of the Syrian desert, much Whoa. to the alarm of his subcommanders. <laughs> in order to survive, it is reported that Khalid, in his ingenuitive way, ordered 20 camels be forced to drink large amounts of water so that they could be used as makeshift storage tanks. The beasts were then periodically slaughtered along the journey when nourishment was needed, and the water was then harvested from the camels. Interesting. After five gruelling days of marching through this desolate landscape, the 9,000-strong Muslim army emerged at Suwa. Then, they swiftly inflicted a minor defeat on the Roman Arab clients, the Ghassanids, at Marj al-Rahit, while they were celebrating Easter. Proving his strategy correct, mm. Khalid's improbable desert crossing had also neutralized the Byzantine defences on the Arabian border. Mm. Now he turned south, towards the Syrian town of Bosra. I mean, this is also what happens when you have two massive empires the Romans and the Persians, uh, just duking it out. You know, oftentimes smaller third powers, um, you know, who may be smaller but still ambitious, like the newly formed Caliphate, are able to take advantage of these giants fighting to take a little chunk for themselves. Where the arrival of his reinforcements led to its capture by mid-July of 634. Mm. Despite this success, the Muslims had little time to celebrate. Roman Emperor Heraclius, who was now in Emesa, sent his brother, Theodore, and an Armenian general named Wadan south towards Ajnadain, 25 miles southeast of Jerusalem, where they began to gather a large army. Spies reported this gathering force to the invaders, and the burgeoning Caliphate's army marched to meet their Byzantine opponents. Mm. Very few hard facts are known about this battle, but we can reconstruct a version of the fight using... Now, it is getting serious now because Heraclius is sort of in the neighborhood. <laughs> you know, he's still a distance away and he hasn't come to fight the Arabs personally, but, you know, he's around. So we're getting some serious Byzantine pushback against uh, the Caliphate, against these Muslim raiders. ...using the available sources. Muslim accounts vastly exaggerate the number of Roman troops they faced, and yeah. it is likely even that the weakened Byzantine forces in Syria, 10,000 strong and commanded by Wardan and Theodore, were outnumbered by the 15,000 Muslims. That's probably likely. I mean, as I was mentioning, um, you know, the Byzantines would always struggle to defend their territory, and especially in the borderlands, it's pretty unlikely that they would have been able to gather uh, a sizable force to fight against uh, the Muslims, um, particularly given that they didn't understand the implications of, um, you know, the Muslim invasion as of yet. Um, but, you know, even if they did, they would have struggled to gather enough men to fight them off, so... Um, yeah, the Arabs probably weren't fighting too many Byzantine troops at this battle. Both armies formed up in extended lines, with their camps to the rear, and both sides stood ready with three divisions of infantry, right, left and centre, while each wing had a cavalry flank guard. Behind the Muslim centre was a small reserve, and in front of their centre was a small group of champions. Hmm. Before the battle began, a Christian bishop rode over to Khalid's army and attempted to negotiate a Muslim withdrawal. However, the Rashidun general simply responded by offering the traditional choice – conversion to Islam, payment of the jizya tax, or death in battle. Jeez. <laughs> the fighting at Ajnadain began when the Byzantine auxiliary missile units, stationed ahead of the main line, began to rain arrows and stones on their adversaries. 
Mm. As the superior Byzantine ranged units loosed, the Muslims suffered losses and were unable to respond. However, one Muslim warrior named Dirar, heavily armoured and brandishing a heavy shield stolen from a Roman soldier, marched directly into the arrow fire, shouting his war cry. After the hail of missiles ceased, Dirar and his entourage of fellow champions were met by their Byzantine counterparts. And so this is the kind of thing that before we even get to what happened, um, these events and battles, these individual stories, particularly these meetings of champions at the beginning of battles, I would say <laughs> these are the things that are most often misrepresented in these ancient sources because it's a good way to sort of foreshadow the outcome of the battle or for the chronicler or historian to make a certain point about the strength of one force or the cunning or the intelligence or whatever. So I think oftentimes stories like these are roundly inaccurate, um, though obviously it's difficult to tell if there is some truth there or not. And it is said the Muslims got the better of the fighting, slaying several Roman elite warriors and two generals. As the dueling came to an end, the Rashidun army attacked, and the subsequent fighting was a slogging match with little maneuver. I will say, in the sources, they described, you know, the uh, Muslim champions got the better of the Romans. The description in the Arab sources, the Muslim sources, were probably far more detailed. There was probably quite a narrative presented. Um, so yeah, just a point on what I was saying about <laughs> the sources we're using and how we should take everything with a grain of salt. And lasted until nightfall. The next day, Byzantine commander Wardan attempted to lure Khalid into a trap by offering a parley, but the plan went wrong and he was instead killed by the fearsome Dirar. Wow. Aiming to exploit the confusion which this loss of leadership caused in the Roman ranks, the Arabs attacked again with their flanks in front and centre behind. After savage hand-to-hand -hand fighting, which exhausted and depleted both armies, Khalid deployed his 4,000-strong reserve in the centre and drove deep wedges through the Roman formations in this area. Mm. Unable to withstand the pressure any further, their line collapsed. Yeah, but regardless of the specifics, which, you know, we can't necessarily be sure of from our sources, what we do know is that, and we're going to get to more of this, but in this time period, uh, the Muslim forces won many victories against the Romans and would definitely push into Roman territory uh, and deal a number of heavy blows against the Byzantine Empire. So that we do know for sure. Um, a lot of the details are pretty fuzzy, but we, we do know the general picture. <laughs> After this defeat, Emperor Heraclius sent his brother Theodore back to Constantinople in disgrace. Damn. At the same time, the remnants of his shattered army, in addition to the local Roman population, withdrew to the apparent safety of the walled cities, which subsequently became crowded with refugees. Mm. Perhaps an omen of things to come, Heraclius then retreated with his headquarters further north to the city of Antioch, due to the fact that Muslim forces now controlled the countryside and were expected to advance on the most prominent urban center in the and Yeah, so once again, another sort of common trend of warfare at the time was that, you know, when we have, and I've already talked about the dynamic of big sedentary empires uh, facing more mobile forces, often nomadic peoples or tribes, um, one of the strategies of an empire would be to have their forces and their civilians retreat to walled cities because, you know, even if you're a very, let's say, skilled force of Arab horsemen, of Arab cavalry, um, you'll probably have a really hard time besieging a, a walled city, particularly if it was built by the Roman engineers of old. And there are many old Roman cities remaining um, with very impressive walls at this point. Um, I mean, that's kind of the whole concept of Constantinople was that the Romans could hide away and it was, you know, almost impenetrable. Um, so this is another common trend we see, I mean, throughout Byzantine and throughout Roman history um, playing out again here. The area. A week after their victory at Ajnadain, the Arab forces began to march north in the direction of Damascus. 
Mm. On their way, they had to leave a mounted detachment at the city of Fal, ancient Pella, to keep the Roman garrison there tied down while the main army marched onward. After this was done, the Muslims reached Yakusa on the southern bank of the Yarmouk River. Here they were opposed by a blocking force of Byzantine troops on the northern shore. Mm. They were in no real position to offer serious permanent resistance, but they were there to delay the invaders and to allow the great city to further prepare for a coming siege. After a short battle here, and another battle against 12,000 Romans at the Yellow Meadow, otherwise known as Major Safar, the road was clear to Damascus. When the invading Arabs neared the city, the Muslim commander realized that his forces were not numerous enough to encircle it entirely. Yeah. Instead, each of the Muslim sub-commanders stationed their contingents outside of the city's various gates, fully blockading the crucial thoroughfares by August 21st with a total of around 20,000 soldiers, 16,000 infantry and 4,000 mobile guard cavalry. Damascus immediately began starving due to the lack of supplies and unpreparedness for a siege. Yeah, not to mention we've already talked about how refugees were fleeing to these cities, so um, probably it was also overcrowded, which is another issue we face in situations like this. Everyone's flooding to the city so that they can be defended and protected from enemies, yet by doing that you're overcrowding the city and... Uh, the food supply is wearing thin. While the Muslims were well supplied due to their domination of the fertile and productive local countryside. Mm. As the swift Arab light horsemen were relatively useless in a siege, Khalid ibn al-Walid sent a few hundred of them to the Eagle's Pass to the north in order to act as scouts. Here they watched for any Byzantine relief force aiming to pass through this choke point. The other half stayed near the city as a reserve, ready to help repel any sortie made by the Romans. Mm. In Antioch, the Roman Emperor learned of the siege and sent a 12,000 strong relief force, along with plentiful supplies, to help Damascus on September 9th. When this force reached the narrow pass where the Muslim scouts were stationed, they pushed the cavalry back. One of these scouts managed to send notice to Al Walid and he, gambling that repelling the relief attempt was more important than maintaining too tight a blockade, took the remaining cavalry at night to the Eagle Pass, where he managed to rout the Romans. I mean, that was probably a correct gamble. You know, they're doing this siege of the city. It's not even a full siege, really. They're not surrounding the city. But, you know, I'm pretty sure they could take on any Byzantine forces that emerged from the walls versus... You know, this relief force uh, seemingly would be pretty important to take it out before it manages to relieve or resupply the city. Um, so uh, I would definitely agree with that course of action, taking on the relief force uh, and perhaps risking the siege of the city be interrupted. Despite their apparent success, the besieging Arab forces were now stretched thin by Khalid's withdrawal. Mm. Historians believe that if the garrison's general Thomas had chosen to launch a sortie at this point, the Byzantines could have broken the siege, but they did not and therefore lost the opportunity. Okay, so, you know, maybe if the Byzantines had taken the initiative, they might have been able to escape the situation, but, you know, the actions of the commander here are very much in line with sort of Byzantine military philosophy. Um, with such a large empire and so much to defend, the Byzantines often adopted a very defensive posture. Um, you know, they would be much more likely to retreat, um, you know, into walled cities and try to defend themselves or not fight battles where they would lose too many men because it just wasn't worth it. You know, if you're going out and fighting a bunch of battles, even if they're victories and you're losing a bunch of men... You know, eventually you're not going to have enough men to protect your empire. So the Byzantine military posture was very defensive in nature, and we can see that here. Though Heraclius was uh, a bit of an exception to that. I mean, as an emperor, he was, um, you know, pretty impressive military leader and was definitely more aggressive and assertive than uh, most Byzantine emperors would be in terms of 
you know, military style or approach. Um, but still, in general, the Byzantine approach to warfare was quite defensive. It's and, and to be fair, it was defensive because it had to be, as I described. Not to mention, a lot of the time it worked. You know, they're facing, um, you know, forces, cavalry forces or nomadic forces or tribes or Arab raiders. You know, a lot of times it would be effective to just hide away in your walled cities. That would be an effective strategy. Um, maybe, you know, the Arabs would leave after a certain period or you would have to pay them off and they would leave you alone. But a lot of the time, it would work. Seems that Al-Walid realized he had put the siege in danger with his gamble, and he hurriedly returned to Damascus after he attained victory at the Eagle's Pass. Mm. As the garrison and Thomas realized that no relief was coming, morale among the defenders of Damascus became weaker and weaker. It was clear action would be needed. So, the Emperor's son-in-law decided to launch a counter-offensive of his own. For Here this first attack, Thomas decided to concentrate on one specific section of the city, drawing men together from all sectors of the city towards the Gate of Thomas, where he was faced by around 5,000 soldiers under Shurabil. After the defending soldiers gathered in the area, the Byzantine commander began his sortie by ordering his archers to rain down a constant stream of arrows against their enemy, mm. to which the Arabs responded accordingly. Using the cover granted by the Roman missile units, the infantry rushed through the gate of Thomas and fanned out into battle formation, with Thomas himself leading the assault. During the subsequent skirmish, it is reported that Thomas both broke through a section of the Muslim line and almost killed Shurabil, but he was then shot in the eye by the widow of a slain Arab soldier. Despite some level of success, the sortie had failed to break the siege, and the Byzantine forces retreated into the city. Uh -oh. As they did, it is said that the injured Roman leader swore to take a thousand eyes in return for his own. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, to be fair, he was probably in a uh, pretty bad mood. <laughs> you know, he was probably pretty upset. You know, just made a, a failed uh, advance out of your city. You've been shot in the eye. Uh, he was probably in a... Uh, uh, he was probably pretty frustrated at that point, so can kind of forgive him for any angry comments. Uh, <laughs> obviously, this is really bad for the Romans. Um, you know, of course, they've done some damage to the Arab forces, but... Uh, the Arabs can always afford to resupply or reinforce, whereas the Romans are stuck inside Damascus. And every failed assault they make just weakens them further. So this situation is basically getting worse and worse. That night, another plan to break the siege was devised by the defenders. As a concentrated attack on one of the gates had failed, Thomas would this time launch simultaneous strikes from four of the gates. Mm. Two large forces were gathered, at the eastern gate where Khalid was in command, and at the gate of Thomas, where the main attack against exhausted enemy units would be undertaken. The other forces at the small gate and the Jabir gate were designed to pin their besiegers in place. Right, I guess we'll see if this is going to work. Uh, I honestly don't know how this battle goes. I would say that, I mean, sending out your forces in multiple different directions, it definitely gives you more chances to break through, but uh, it also seems a lot riskier. You know, your one set of your men could get completely overrun, and perhaps even worse, uh, they could let uh, the opposing forces into the city which is much less of a risk when you send one condensed force out uh, to fight, uh, you know, a sortie, a battle, and then if you lose, you retreat back in. So, you know, perhaps this will work. It does give you more opportunities to defeat your enemies and slip through, but it also does seem quite risky to me. As Thomas sounded the attack, a grinding battle took place at the Jabia Gate, with both sides suffering many losses. Mm. After a while of this slaughter, Abu Abida and his forces at this gate managed to doggedly repulse the Byzantine assault, driving them back into the city. Mm. The situation was far more serious at the eastern gate, where the Byzantines had a larger force. 
Okay. This larger contingent of defenders managed to break the Arab infantry and drive them back, but Khalid himself then arrived with 400 elite mobile guard cavalry and with them struck the Roman flank. Yeah, Khalid uh, doing what he does best, uh, leading uh, at an opportune moment when, well, not an opportune moment, but leading impressively when he's needed the most uh, and sending his cavalry around for a flanking maneuver uh, at an opportune moment. This weakened the sortie irreversibly and the defenders were slowly driven back inside the gates. Once again, however, the worst of the fighting occurred at the Gate of Thomas. Here, the Byzantine forces were led by the one-eyed Thomas himself, <laughs> and after intense fighting, there was still no weakness in the Muslim ranks. Jeez. At this point, the Roman commander seems to have realized there was no point in continuing the grinding melee, and commanded a slow, steady withdrawal. Punish All Thomas. The, while, the Arab archers continually showered his men with arrows. This was the last effort by Thomas to break the Muslim siege, and it had failed with the loss of thousands of men. Yeah. With this defeat, he could no longer afford any more attempts at a breakout. Yeah, and that's exactly what I was saying earlier. That's the risk. You keep making attempts to break out, which in this situation he had to do. He had no choice, but every time you fail, you get continually and continually weaker until you can no longer resist. and. Seems that Thomas is sort of in an untenable position at this point. A Greek in Damascus, known as Jonah the Lover in Arab sources, climbed mm. over the wall and informed Khalid that on the night of the 18th of September, there would be a Christian religious ceremony which would leave the walls relatively unguarded. Tricky? Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> this, this Greek just climbing over the walls and giving away... Uh, uh, Roman secrets. <laughs> Tricky guy, huh? He supposedly betrayed his city because his marriage to his fiancée had been interrupted by the siege and, frustrated, asked for the Muslims' help in obtaining said bride. I mean, that's probably not true. I'm sure that's something that was just made up, but, I mean, if it was, what a, like, stupid reason. <laughs> like, come on, what was his name, Jonah the Lover? What are you doing, man? You're, you're that desperate? <laughs> Probably not true, but, you know, come on. This man soon converted to Islam, but the details are incredibly vague. Mm. Right. Whatever the case, details of the opportunity led Khalid to borrow ladders from a local monastery and to purchase ropes in order to form an assault party. Hmm. That night, a 100-strong contingent led by the Muslim general himself climbed the walls, dropped into the city, and killed the guards at the eastern gate. Then the attackers flung open the gate and let the remainder of the Muslim forces at the eastern gate inside the city. There you go. They're in. Thing is, with the siege, it can last weeks, months, years. All it takes is one piece of secret information, one person slipping up, one enemy sneaking in. That's all it takes, and then, bam, the gates are open, and uh, the siege is over. Your city is now being invaded. <laughs> the other Byzantine detachments stationed elsewhere were unaware of this surprising development and instead of helping, stayed at their posts. Mm. At the same time, Khalid began to fight his way towards the center of the city. Now attempting to save the city for a final time, Thomas sent envoys to Abu Ubaidah at the Western Jabiya Gate, offering surrender and a payment of the jizya in exchange for a capitulation by terms. Mm. This was given by the supposedly peace-loving Abu Ubaidah. However, Khalid, who had finished slaughtering his way to the center of the city, was furious that a surrender had been allowed even though the city had technically been taken by storm. Nevertheless, the many Muslim unit commanders agreed that a surrender would be honored. Khalid reluctantly accepted this judgment. Really? The fall of Damascus was a shock for the Byzantines, as they probably thought that the Muslim attack on the region was a massive raid and not a full-on invasion. Mm. Syria and Egypt were the most important provinces of the empire, and the fall of the former would mean that the land route to the latter was cut, and it 
which was now also vulnerable to being occupied. All right, we're going to cut it off there. <laughs> we have to cut it off at some point. Um, so, I, you know, I apologize for the, uh, you know, the cut in the middle of the action, but we just finished the Siege of Damascus, uh, a pretty important moment. I feel like this is a good point to cut it off, and we can come back next time for more exciting content. Um, you know, it's exciting that we're finally getting into more um, Caliphate versus uh, Roman Empire action. Uh, that's what I was sort of waiting for. I know a little bit more about that. Um, I think we're going to get some really important battles following this one. Now that uh, the Muslims have sort of gotten themselves a foothold in the region, uh, they're going to continue their advance. Um, they're going to continue fighting battles against the Romans, and we'll see next time uh, how some of those are going to go. Uh, so this is the end of part two of four. Uh, that means we've got two more parts to go. Um, with this episode or this video in particular. And I appreciate the advice that some of y'all have left in your comments. You said that uh, I'll finish watching this one and then I should go straight to the next uh, really long video, like two hours or longer than two hours, I think, um, skipping the small parts in between because it's like a compilation video of all the smaller parts. And then after that, I'll watch the other videos which have not yet been made into uh, you know a really long video. Um, so yeah, this was a good one. Um, you know, I've enjoyed this series so far. Um, you know, we've had some interesting discussions about the topic, the sources, uh, looking at different sources and analyzing them. Uh, I find this stuff all really fascinating given, you know, I'm a history student, history student reacts. This is right up my alley, of course. Uh, if you guys enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate it if you would leave a like, subscribe to the channel and check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. I hope you guys are all having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.